Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today on the show, we are honored to be sitting down with Brantford, Ontario, Councillor Rose Sicoli. But before we get into that interview, I'd like to ask a favor. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button or follow button wherever you're getting this interview and show today. Whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcast, or on YouTube, hit that subscribe button today. We couldn't embark on this journey without support and dedicated followers like yourself who are listening to this episode or watching this episode. So please take a moment and hit that subscribe button because you do not want to miss the amazing interviews that we have coming up with municipal leaders from across Canada. Now on to our interview. Rose, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a general question and it's kind of the premise of this entire interview and this entire show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rose? That's such a loaded question, Chris. Um, <laughs> Start off the hard um, one I, right off the bat. <laughs> it's such a loaded question. And I often joke that if somebody's asking you why you would do this, they probably wouldn't understand to begin with. Um, but I do understand in the, the interview context that uh, it's a question everyone has. So um, I tell the story of, when I was a little girl, um, I had my my cousin was an MP. He was one of the youngest MPs uh, ever to be elected in in Hamilton. Um, so we were always sort of um, watching the political world and watching my cousin speak on TV, and um, we were involved in in campaigning and things like that. And that really piqued my interest in seeing the change that he was having and the effect that he was having. Um, so that sort of sparked my, my intrigue with the political realm. And then when I was a little girl, um, I remember this park near my house, like a playground had fallen into such disre disrepair. And it was really at this pivotal age where I was realizing what other parks and other neighborhoods looked like. And, you know, why was my park looking like this when there was this potential for this great park? And, I remember my mother and I writing a letter to my city councillor at the time and um, asking for a new park. And I remember my mother letting me stay up late and watching him on TV, reading my letter and bringing forth, in, in hindsight, a resolution to, to build a new park at Browns Park in Hamilton. And I remember seeing that park come to life. And from there on out, I was sold that this is what I wanted to do. Um, so the rest of my life has been about volunteering in the community and, and with um, charity. And then when I became older, I got into real estate. And through real estate, I, I started serving on the board of directors for my local association. Um, so that gave me some governance uh, experience. And in that role, I took on um, a government relations position there. And I started with um, advocating for the industry and for stronger standards and for better better regulation, both provincially and federally, as well as locally. Um, and yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history, but I want to talk about that history because yes. I, I, I traditionally try not to do a lot of research. And the only thing that I try to do research on my guests is when they were first elected. Now, uh, the Ontario... The province of Ontario is not the best for keeping records open to the general public of election results from past. And maybe it's because most people not, like myself are not going through them and looking for these results. The first election that I can find that you ran in was in a by-election in 2021. So you oh, did not yeah. proceed to run in 2018, but you decided in a by-election for Ward 1 in the city of Brantford that you were going to run. Now, I want to sort of ask a two-part question here. What made you decide that 2021 was the right time to run in a by-election compared to 2018 or wait another year to run in the general election in 2022? That's that's a great question. And I always had a plan to run in 2022. Um, and I was, in 2018, I was the president-elect for the Real Estate Association. And for me, it was um, really important for me to to complete 
the obligation that I sent it, set out for myself and, and um, make sure that I serve my association as president and and get that governance experience. And with that, I, I received some high level governance training from Watson's governance training that I felt would best position me for the 2022 election. Um, and then at that time, I was also I had decided to go back to a university to work towards my um, degree, my my bachelor's degree with a focus on political science. So I was doing that part time, all in the in my mind that I was going to run and I thought all of this was going to position me beautifully um, to be a really effective counselor. Um, and then in 2021, there was this vacancy and it was in my ward where I had lived, the only ward I had ever lived in Brantford. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, the synchronicities were there and I felt really ready at that point. I had completed my term. I ended up serving two terms as president of the Brantford Regional Real Estate Association and navigated uh, COVID and took on that leadership role through COVID. And I felt really ready in 2021 that I would be a strong candidate and I would at the very least be um, highly considered by council as someone who should be taking on that role. Um, and <laughs> it worked out for me. There were 21 candidates that put their name forward in that, um, at that point to fill that vacancy. And I was the, the successful candidate at that time. So, uh, the rest was history. <laughs> so you, you're a unique guest for me because most of my guests that I've had on have either been elected a general election or have been acclaimed in an election. They've never run in a by they might have run in a by election, but I've never been able to ask this because I haven't been able to find information on them. You're coming and it in wasn't a by election, just so you know. It, it was, was a by election. A, it was not a by election. It was a very unique process. Um, that the city of council, uh, city of Brantford council at that time had decided to go to move forward. So what happened was there was a vacancy um, and the cost that would have gone into running a by-election um, and the proximity to the next election, it didn't really make sense to open it right up. So what the city council did was um, opened it up to all residents to apply we all went to a special city council meeting. We gave a five minute speech and provided in advance our resumes and things like that. Um, and then city council voted on who should be the next counselor. Yes. <laughs> and you can watch this. <laughs> oh, on YouTube. I, I there. will be certainly watching this after this conversation. So this brings up a complete new range of questions now that I was not prepared to ask, but I want to get into this because yeah. I, I I know someone who had that uh, who had that happen to them as well. Literally, my aunt, because in the nineties, uh, someone had passed away on council. They had to fill a regional vacancy, so they appointed her from the council, and anyone could apply. For you, this is a unique sort of selection and i don't want to say election i want to say a selection because you're getting selected by the members of the current council yeah. going into that meeting you're seeing 20 other people in that room who are vying for that same spot but at the end of the day they looked at you and said okay rose has something that we want to see on council did you feel there's a little bit more weight now on your shoulders when you go into that council for that first year because your fellow councillors are saying We've chosen you. Don't screw this up because we think you're the right person for this job. How much weight did you have to put on yourself to make sure that you got it right in that first year? There was a tremendous <laughs> amount of pressure to to prove myself, to to be who who they felt they were electing and I I had a I had a lot of confidence in myself that I was the right person. Um, at that point, I know gender balance had a lot, probably had a lot to do with um, the selection as well. Um, having someone that had proven to already work well with most of the counselors just through, through from a different perspective, albeit um, it was more of a collaborative effort in bettering the community through advocacy and whatnot. So I had those established relationships and um, I think bringing together the council was 
something that was on everyone's mind um, as somebody neutral, because there was a very, at that point, a very divided council um, as well. Um, it was more, the pressure that I felt was more from the public, right? People were, it was all eyes on me, like, who is this? Who is this woman that sort of seemingly came out of the woodwork? Because there were a lot of previous counselors that have put their name forward oh. and people with actual experience as, as a counselor. And that might've been maybe the easy choice, but not necessarily the best choice for work for the temperament of counsel at that time. Um, so the pressure that I felt really truly was proving myself to, to the residents and to the constituents of the ward. Um, and then of course the election that, followed shortly thereafter less than a year later was a lot of pressure on me too a lot of people challenging for that seat right there is a weight that is put on you as a municipal counselor to make sure that you're impacting the residents in a positive way and you have to make decisions that are sometimes contentious and sometimes issues that are sometimes not going to please a hundred percent of the people <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine, <laughs> after two and a half, <laughs> exactly. How do you balance that as an elected official that the decisions you make are impacting people at a local level the day after you make them? It's, I often joke, I said, it's probably easier to be an MP or an MPP because when I make a decision, when I put a bike lane in somewhere, you know, I'm running into people at Sobeys who are mad at me, you know, so it's very um, at your doorstep and um, I think you just learn to be okay with not everybody liking you all the time. And that's a really hard thing for my personality type, um, because I genuinely do feel that I act, um, from a really, a really good place in my soul. Um, so the first thing that I always ask myself is, will this better the community as a whole, there's going to be one or two people often that don't agree or don't like what is being done, but will the community as a whole be better off for by this decision? Um, and then the second thing I ask myself, you know, is, is there a public safety concern here? Am I addressing a public safety concern? Is it whether that be speeding or, you know, pedestrians or um, you know, a, a, an element of crime or something that we're addressing. Um, is this the safety issue? Because then you can just prioritize the safety of it. Um, you know, and I, I really just try to look at it from a very simple place. When you really dumb it down and become very <laughs> simplistic about it, the decisions become remarkably easy. Um, and is it harder really to sell the issue to the people or is it harder to make the decision? It's harder for me to make the decision, right? Once I've made the decision, once I go through my little checklist in my head and determine that this is or is not a good idea, I'm able to speak from a place of authenticity when I'm addressing a concern from someone who maybe disagrees, right? And I, at the end of the day, when I lay my head on my pillow at night, I feel that I made the right, truly in my heart, made the right decision. Um, and I think that authenticity really shows through. And oftentimes, once I speak to a concerned resident, there's usually an underlying issue that hasn't been addressed for them. And this sort of was a, a spark for them, you know, um, and we're able to talk it through. And most people are are okay with it at the end of the day. Um, but listening to the residents, if you get 50 emails speaking against something or people that are opposed, that tells you there's probably a hundred more people that feel the same way. So listening to the residents um, in numbers, you know, and realizing that not everyone is going to be happy with everything I do, but as long as I'm authentic, it usually translates through and people will understand at the end of the day. Yeah. There's a key word I want to pick up there and that is listening. Now, you've been elected by not 100% of the people, and you know that, and I can imagine that's something that weighs on you because you have to represent everyone. Now, there are going to be people who disagree with you. Like you said, there's people who are going to be upset with some of the decisions. 
how important is it not to only just listen to the people who agree with you, but to listen to the people who disagree with you? But, and I want to caveat this in a respectful manner, because I don't want people to come up to you and start swearing and yelling and screaming at you because that's not going to be respectful. And I 100% I agree that local municipal leaders have the right to say, if you want to talk to me in a respectful manner, here's my card. Talk to me later. I don't have time for this. How important is it to listen to both sides and not just be entrenched into your sort of social echo, uh, so, 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 the, your uh, <laughs> ecosystem that is social media and the people that you hang around with? Oh, yes. The days of algorithms um, <laughs> is quite interesting to me. So um, that's, I think, if I were to pride myself on anything, probably the one thing that I'm really good at is um, acknowledging my own echo chamber um, to which I, I am <laughs> living in. And I would put more weight on listening to the concerns of someone who has an opposing view. Um and that's really, and it's happened time and time again, where I, I, my instinct on the fly is to vote one way. And then you hear from the residents and you hear from people and you talk and you start to, you know, shop an idea amongst other counselors and you end up saying, you know what, I never considered that. And it's, that's what makes someone a really good counselor when they're not too driven by their own ego to be able to change your mind and say, Hey, you know what? And I've said this before, like, you know what? I, I actually spoke to our lawyers here and I've changed my mind. So sorry, <laughs> sorry that I voted this way at committee of the whole, but um, you know, this is why ABCD, I now think it's best to do this instead. Um, and that's a, just a sign of a really good municipal counselor, I think. And um, so, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of weight to the opposing side of things. And I think every counselor would probably agree with that. I, well, before I turn to my next segment, I want to ask this one last question on the personal life of a counselor. Now, you are counselor 24 seven. You are not just counselor when you're in that council meeting. You go to the grocery store, you are counselor. And I can imagine yeah. there's days that you just want to be Rose. You just want to go out, grab your carton of milk and come back or a bag of milk in Ontario and then come back home and not spend two hours, half hour, 45 minutes uh, talking to people because sometimes you just need to be Rose, whether it be at home for your own sake, for your own mental health, you need just some downtime. Is it hard in a community like Brantford to find that balance, particularly at the local level, because you are there? 24 seven, you're not at Queens Park, you're not at the House of Commons, you are in Brantford doing your job. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that is a mental burden that I think we all um, find our own vices um, to deal with it in its own way, because it's, there's a lot of times I'm like, you know, I got two daughters. So I'm like, here's a $10 bill now in the province of Ontario. Go grab that bag of milk. You know, I, I'm just going to stay in the car with my sunglasses on. <laughs> I know that's bad, but sometimes it's just, I just want to run out in my joggers with my mom <laughs> bun hair in no makeup on and just um I think this you know, is the most you... honest answer yeah. to this question I have ever gotten <laughs> and so it is true. the best yeah. <laughs> yeah I just want to hide in the car with my sunglasses on with no makeup and you know um just but it comes with the a... job right it comes with the it job and you you job. knew that getting into it of course of course and you know at 99 I am a type a personality in case you haven't noticed so I'm a-okay to be out there in the world and peopling and you know and then I go to the gym and I just download it on the weight bench and um it, it's it really is okay but there are times where I'm just like I don't have it in me <laughs> I don't have it in me today you know Good for you. So I want to turn to segment two. And this I need to preface before we get into this conversation because it's an important preface. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of the city of uh, Brantford. This is not a policy of the city of Brantford. This is not even a direction of council of the city of Brantford. This is an opinion of the councillors and the opinion of the councillor only. So, councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, 
What do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Brantford today as of recording? As of recording, and you know, it, it hasn't changed um, since the election. Our biggest issue here in the city of Brantford is that um, Canadian real estate magazine named Brantford the number one place to buy and invest in real estate <laughs> in 2017. And it's been um, since then a tremendous amount of growth in our community and um, people flocking to our community and the population has grown um, really, really quickly. Um, and we are building homes more quickly than any other community in um, in Ontario. So our biggest concern right now is providing, we're in this in between the um, stage where people are coming and we're building, but our infrastructure needs um, are sort of lagging and we're, we're trying to sort out, okay, how do we not only get caught up with the needs of the community, but how are we going to prepare for 20 years from now for our community? Where is that money coming from? Um, how do we navigate the growing population in regards to our healthcare system, our school system, um, just our, our basic amenities that we're offering. Um, so I think we have a heavy, heavy focus as a council, as, as a whole, um, into prioritizing that. Um, same with our, our city transit systems. Um, we need to, we're playing catch up in a way because we didn't see this growth coming um, as rapidly as it did. Um, so I would definitely say that that's our biggest issue is, is coming together and agreeing on not only the priority list in playing catch up with everything that we offer here, but um, where are we going to get the funding for that, especially with some of the changes that have come down recently from the provincial government in the form of, you know, all the recent bills, Bill 109 and, and whatnot. So navigating that is going to be the challenge, especially as we move into our estimates. So committee. I, I want to pick up there and I want to sort of ask the semi-million dollar question here because I think it's important. Growth is good. I, I, I know some people may say it's bad, but I think it's good because it, A, it brings people to your community. It lowers the tax base. That means people are paying less for services, but you're still providing the same services. But infrastructure, as you know, for someone who's been in there for two years now, is going through the roof. Uh, prices to do uh, build uh, pipelines for just water, wastewater transfer stations, roads these things are getting more expensive and you have to decide the what is the best way forward to grow your city sustainably but not do it on the backs of residents and i think that's the key word i want to pick up here is you you want to make sure people aren't being negatively impacted by the growth that's coming because until growth comes you don't have that uh, population boom that people are gonna uh, see tax lowers so as a council, as you, as the councillor for Ward 1, how do you look at the growth of your community without forgetting about the here and now, without forgetting about the people who are here and not building that growth on the backs of the people of Brantford? I love <laughs> million, that. That's... million dollar question, million but dollars. enough. <laughs> um, you know, and... and... I know, and it, it, be, it really began last year, we're looking at our budget and we're saying, okay, we had budgeted, this isn't our capital budget, but it's no longer enough money because everything, the price of everything has changed and what we budgeted to do this year, we budgeted four or five years ago and it's totally irrelevant now. So not only are we playing, trying to find creative ways to supplement that deficiency in our budget, um, we're looking at creative financial solutions to how are we going to be able to continue building the infrastructure that we need. And, you know, we have, we're sl Brantford slated for a new hospital. Well, there's a huge price tag um, on the municipality to help bring that forward. So um, the creatives, and I'm so privileged to be working with some really great financial minds, um, 
around the council chambers. We have a lot of um, fiscally intuitive um, counselors who are up there who are really good at finding those ways to shift money in the budget um, and not increase the property taxes tremendously. Um, so we do this a few ways, right? We look at growth is a really great way. You know, when we look at, well, we can put four houses here or we could put an apartment building, mm, the property tax revenue is a lot different between the two, right? So that's something that we need to consider as we're, we're moving forward. Um, the other thing that we just recently did um, last night actually was our first committee meeting is a joint services meeting between the County of Brant and the City of Brantford. And uh, that, that was a fun meeting. I was actually um, elected as um, co-chair of that meeting. So myself and then we have a, a chair representing the county. Um, we'll sort of be um, taking a leadership role in this. Two women, I might add. So I'm very um, optimistic that we'll get things done. Um, but this was a committee that started in 2017 that just with butting heads just couldn't get too, too, too far. Um, there were some uh, achievements, but I just think there's so many Synch synchronicities between our communities where we can find a tremendous amount of cost savings for both of our communities. Um, so that's really a way where I think we're, we're going to be able to work together. And at the end of the day, the residents don't respect the boundaries of our communities the way we do as counselors. And we become very protective of those communities and those boundaries and, hey, stay in your lane. But Again, if you simplify this and you are representing the residents, they don't care if their doctor is in the county, the town over, or if you live in the county, if their doctor is in the city. And um, they don't care that their kids are going to go ice skating in the city versus the county. People don't respect those boundaries, and we need to acknowledge that and move forward in a spirit of collaboration that we can build these things together and you know, if we have, if we're both paying someone to do the same job, maybe we're just paying one person to do it for all of us and represent our entire community. Um, so I'm really cautiously optimistic that um, we're going to be able to address some of those issues through this committee. Um, and I look forward to taking on a leadership role in that and seeing how far we can take it and and where we can go from there. So there's that I want to pick up on that in the later date because I think this is an important conversation because I've been following that story for some time now. And I, I want to talk to you about that off the record after the conversation. But I, I want to turn to the issues again. And you yeah. know that you as someone who's been stopped a few times, probably at the grocery store at the parks when they're out with your daughters. You've probably been stopped and people have talked about their issues. They've talked about the issues that they see that are important. And you as counselor have to balance the needs of the city as a whole with the individual issues. And that means sometimes because you don't have an unlimited supply of money, unfortunately, municipalities can't run deficits. So therefore, you have to balance every year. You have to say no to people. Their wants, their needs are great. Their wants and needs are important. But the realities of what the financial situations of municipalities are in is a complete unknown to a lot of people. How do you see yourself balancing the needs and wants of the individual person with compared to the city? Because you don't want people to feel like they're not being heard or not being respect it when they come to you with their issues, whether it be a pothole or to hearken back to your original entrance into municipal politics. What if someone did come up to you and say, I need a new park in my community because I don't feel like there's one in my community. And you know, you're not going to be able to potentially do that. How do you balance those individual needs? Um, to be perfectly honest, there's always a way. Like I, I've never not there's, there's almost always a way. It might not be an immediate solution, um, but there's always a way to balance that. And for, at a municipal level, most of what I get is either very minuscule, okay? Um, so sometimes it's, there's a lip in the sidewalk. 
easy, I can fix that tomorrow or a pothole easy. I can get a team out there tomorrow. That's what they do. Um, what I find most challenging is when someone stops me and we're having really big picture conversations like homelessness. What are we doing about the homelessness issue? What are we doing about the highway, the transportation issues? You know, these are really big picture, um, heavy topics that to be honest, sometimes have no real solution. And if, if they do, it's not necessarily at a municipal level. It's, um, so those issues weigh on me more, um, than just the random calls that I do get, um, new parks and whatnot. There's always a way it might be five years down the, in the budget, because that's where the money's still available, but, um, there's a way to, you know, solidify that for the resident, um, but those really heavy, big picture issues that have no real solution, those are the tough ones for me to, so, uh, to address. You talked about the heavy, big picture stuff. And the heavy, big picture stuff sometimes, and I'm not saying all the times, are not traditionally in the municipal jurisdictional role and responsibilities. These potentially could be provincial or even federal. Before I ask the question about how you deal with not just brushing people off and saying it's not our issue. Do you get a sense that the people of the city of Brantford understand the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities that the municipality, <laughs> you're already, she's not even answering the question already. And here we are for those who are listening to this right now. Um, so do, do you actually not agree? Do you not, do you not think that people understand that the municipality is, in, is responsible for this provincial is responsible for this. Then you go to your MPP and the federal government is responsible for this role. And you have to go to your MP. Are you getting people yeah. coming to you thinking that you're yeah. going to respond their federal issues? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, you know, Hey, Healthcare? can you help me get Canadian <laughs> citizenship? Like, probably if I make a phone call, but not me. Right. Like, I, yeah. So, um, it, when someone reaches out to me, like I said, there's almost always a solution and whether, and I have always, and will always continue to maintain a really good, um, working relationship with both our MP and our MPP for this reason, because, and, and likewise, when they get a resident that reaches out to them for something that's municipal, they flip it over to me and I handle it for them. Um, and, you know, I've had people call like, can you help me with my passport or, um, you know, our, our school, we need a new school. Right. And it, through collaboration with all tiers of government, we're able to, satisfy the needs of of the resident but and they're grateful to get to have me reach out to them because they want to help everybody's in this role um because we want to help right so otherwise they may not have had that opportunity to meet that resident to assist that resident to get that self-satisfaction of being able to help someone so um we work together closely and there's but people truly don't understand the responsibility or, or what is what we are allowed to do. Um, and I find that it's most prevalent in the housing and development realm. Um, they really think that the municipality has a lot more power than they do to shut down building houses. And, um, <laughs> you know, we, we really don't have that much say, um, we, we try and it's in our best interest to work well with builders and developers. So we build a, a cohesive community that everyone can be proud of, but, at the end of the day, we can't really stop a lot of what's happening, you know, with the building and. Yeah. Um, I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when we talk about <laughs> communities <laughs> and I've been trying to change that. So I'm going to okay. let you, I, I got to give you a little bit of time here. What's there to be proud about Brantford? What are the things that are going on in the community right now that you point to people, you point to point to when you're talking to other municipal leaders from across Canada or even in Ontario, you say, you know what, you might be doing it right, but we're doing it better because we've got this going for us. What what are those issues that you point to and you just boast about all the time in Brantford? You know what, we are really in this transitional period of being very forward thinking. I'm so proud to have a council surrounding me that's 
very forward thinking, looking to the future. Um, we're not, we're not in this mindset of like, not in my backyard, you know, like we're very, what can we do that's cool and exciting? And, and, you know, we just recently acquired the Brantford Bulldogs. We, we stole them from Hamilton and I don't plan on giving them back, but, you know, we have this new sense of the community rallying behind an OHL team, uh, an Ontario hockey league team. Right. So um, that's been huge for the community. Um, we're also um, in this phase of um, becoming a lot more culturally diverse. So we're finding new sports coming into our name into our neighborhood and new needs from some from mostly um, from the South Asian community who is moving into the neighborhood and their needs and their cultures and their traditions we're finding that are coming in and really helping to educate and diversify our neighborhoods. And I am a huge trail walker and like, so I'm always out in the trails and walking in my neighborhood and it brings me so much joy to walk through the neighborhood and see um, a family playing cricket in the park or um, gathering along, you know, a picnic table in the park and just seeing culture. Like I want my children to see culture and to be accepting of different types of um, backgrounds, both religious and, and ethnic backgrounds. So that brings me so much joy and learning, right? I do a, a lot of learning from different communities and learning about why they do what they do and what their needs are. And, and it brings me personal, just a really a different level of personal satisfaction to be able to provide that in a community that otherwise um, didn't have the the need for it at one time. And, you know, so one of the big things that's in the works right now, we should see soon is a, like a provincial level cricket pitch coming in because the, the population of cricket players has grown so tremendously and, and there's tournaments that they're trying to hold and we don't really have the capacity to provide for them. So that was one thing that I was able to bring forward that will be located in my ward um, is a tournament style cricket pitch. And I think that it will really benefit the community regardless of background or culture. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And I, I hope yeah. now that I've been asking this question more often, the person who accused me stops accusing me, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I am cautious of time here and I want to turn to my last segment. It's my, it's my favorite segment because I enjoy visiting communities in Canada, I, I don't get me wrong. I love going across, uh, international, but sometimes seeing what's green on the other side of the fence in Canada is always great. And visiting our neighbors is always great as well. So as someone who tried to make it to Brantford last summer, but was unable to due to the fact that I had to rush back to Calgary driving across Canada, I'm making a plan to stop there next summer. So right before AMO conference. So in your opinion, what are some hidden treasures that tourists need to see while they're in the city of Brantford? So there's a few. So Brantford, not only are we home to Wayne Gretzky, which everybody knows that. So we had we do have the Wayne Gretzky Sports Center um, if you're into um, taking up some sports. But um, we're also home to Alexander Graham Bell. So we have the Bell Homestead. You can come and explore where the telephone was actually invented. Um, that is still present here. And there's a great museum surrounding that. Um, we're also home to Phil Hartman, who was voice. I'm a huge Simpsons fan. So voice on the Simpsons. Uh, he, we're working on getting him a, um, a public art piece that people can come and appreciate. Now, if you're outside of, you know, just stopping and looking at things, uh, the Grand River offers so much to do tubing and and kayaking and canoeing and you can go for you know kilometers and kilometers and really enjoy some outdoor time uh Brantford is a hub of trails so Brantford from Brantford you can go everywhere from Port Dover and Simcoe um out to uh, Hamilton and Niagara Falls you can really explore our vast trail system uh, whether through biking or walking um, there's a lot to do here and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and you're going to call me for lunch when you come. <laughs> yes, I certainly will. But I want to ask, because I, I, I kind of, I understand where this question is probably going to go, but I just want to put it on the record as well. 
Where do you go? Where do you go to decompress? After a long day of work, after a stressful day of council meetings, after a long day of just being mom to your two uh, wonderful kids, where do you go to just let it all go and recenter yourself? Because you know tomorrow morning, it's back at it, trying to make your community a better place, trying to make yourself a better counselor. Where, where in the community do you get a way to escape? Well, if I'm not shopping, I'm spending <laughs> Um, I'm either always at the gym. You'll find me at the gym, um, Movadi here. And otherwise, my bliss, my true bliss is on the trails. You will always, I am on the l &E trails, um, just walking and it's such a beautiful time of year it's fall and aut like autumn here and uh, everything is just orange and and yellow and red and it's beautiful at this time of year so you will find me and my little english bulldog who's not so little walking all over the trail system just with a podcast on zoning out I'm going to end this entire interview with one million dollar question. And it's a question I think every municipal politician knows how to answer. But I think it's important to have it on the record. In your opinion, what makes the city of Brantford such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? The city of Brantford is so special. And I think it's one of the most unique communities because we call ourselves a little big city. We're not a huge metropolitan like a Hamilton or a Toronto, right? But we offer all the same amenities and we're right off the highway. Um, so we're just, I'm a 20 minute drive to Hamilton. I'm a one hour drive to London. I'm about an hour and a half from the border. Um, but we don't have that big city mentality, right? We're still a very small community. And everybody knows everybody. We're growing, but we're still a small community with a population of, a, I think we're at about 110 right now. Um, but, you know, we have the Costco's and the mall. We have Costco coming. <laughs> it's being built right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I need to say this because I found this hilarious. I like how you <laughs> say 110 is not big. Every other municipality <laughs> across Canada is going 110. That's not big. What does she think is big then? <laughs> Well, I'm surrounded by, you know, Hamilton's got 600,000 and we got London and um, Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo. Like we have a lot of big um, municipalities around us and then we're we're in the middle and we're kind of where everybody's landing. And we're, we call ourselves a, a little big city. Um, we still have this very small community, but we're big. Right. And so we're a little big city. That's what I call it. Uh Rose, I want to thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, I, I know I said 45 minutes, we're almost at the 55 minute mark here, but uh, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been a, a very great way to start a day, in my opinion. So thank you so much for sitting down. But also, and I, I say this with sincerity to uh, a, a lot of times, but I want people to understand this is a sincere statement. Thank you for serving your community. It truly seems like you have a passion for what you're doing and you want the betterment for your community. And in the 50 minute conversation we have, Brantford has a bright future with you at the council table. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and keep doing the hard work and helping people learn and grow um, through, through education and through learning and understanding. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. 
Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.